Okay, everybody, thank you for joining us um, to hear a little bit about the plight of the Bob White. We're, we're really excited today um, to, to have this presentation. I'll, I'll um, introduce our speakers in just a moment here. Um, just I'm gonna do a little housekeeping, a little familiarization here um, with, with our organization, MRBO, the Missouri River Bird Observatory. Um, we work a lot under these pillars, these eggs here, bird-friendly communities quality habitats, uh, feeding the flock, people, and nature. We accomplish our mission through scientific research, bird population monitoring, policy advocacy, and community education um, and outreach. You can find more about our work at mrbo.org. Um, these two guests that we have today really help fit in with our mission. Um, and a little final housekeeping thing here, if you're not familiar with Zoom, um, you can use the chat feature to chat with other attendees if you like, um, and you can uh, post any questions that you have for the presenters in the Q&A section. Uh, that just keeps things uh, easy for us to find your, your questions and engage uh, once, the, once the presentations are over. Um, so yeah, um, I put in a, a couple eggs here because these guys are good eggs. Uh, those are our quail eggs there, a photo from one of our, our projects uh, throughout the Missouri grasslands. Um, but these these two good eggs, uh, Frank Longcarriage and Kyle Hedges, um, there's an old picture I found of them on the internet from just a few years ago, 2015, I think, where they received the National Bob White Quail Conservation Initiative's Firebird Conservation Award, which is no small feat. Um, Frank, uh, the guy on the right there, he'll go first, and he's a wildlife biologist, management biologist for the Missouri Department of Conservation in Southwest Missouri. He's been in the MDC for 15 years and manages seven conservation areas to include four native prairies. He also conducts quail research and co-led the largest quail study in Missouri history. Uh, Kyle Hedges is a wildlife management biologist as well. And, and uh, he, he's been working for about uh, 20 years with the Missouri Department of Conservation. He manages several public areas, including eight native prairies. He and Frank uh, co-led that big study. Um, so uh, without further ado, um, we'll, we'll welcome Frank here. I'll stop my, my screen share if possible. You should be good to go now. All right, thank you, Ethan. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Ethan and, and Dana for, for having us. Um, this means a lot to, to us, to, to me and to Kyle. I know we, uh, we relish any chance that we get to talk about Bob White's a species that we both grew up with intimately um, as a part of our lives. It was just a part of the landscape when we grew up and we grew up hunting them. And it was a large part of the reason I know that I went into study wildlife management and um, to, to be able to have a chance to talk about them as much as we do, to be able to chance to, to study them and to manage them is a real treat and a real blessing. So thanks for hey, allowing us. Hey, to... Frank, I'm really yeah. sorry to interrupt you. Um, oh. We are seeing your notes um, okay. on the right hand side. Yeah, which, I'm not I mean, sure. it's not a problem, but I don't know that you I'm want not to sure how to how to Okay. I'll do it. Perfect. Hey, yeah. thanks attendees. We don't yeah, do PowerPoint, so we didn't know that. Thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, so anyway, um, as I was saying, Kyle and I are, are, are super uh, excited to be able to, to work with Quail and, and to, to give this presentation. So, so one of the one how I like to start off with is is when I have a forum like this, I always like, and we always like to start off with really talking about the plight of of Bob White. So the, the quail problem is an important problem. Uh, it's important to the, to the state of, of Missouri. It's important nationally because the population is declining, but it's also important to, to me on a personal level. Uh, this young man is my son, Caleb. Uh, he killed his first Bob White a couple of years ago. It's a picture of him with his first Bob White taken on a conservation area that is managed for, um, for grassland management in, in Southwest Missouri. And subsequently he got his first bird dog the next spring. And so I'm bringing along a generation, a new generation of bird hunters 
So the plight of quail is, is, is personal to me. I want to see quail be able to persist in huntable numbers so that, that this guy can hunt quail when he's my age, close to home, like I have. And so, so it's not only a problem from, from a large scale, but it's a personal problem. But it's also a serious problem. Let's talk about some things. Pennsylvania has listed their Bob White as extirpated. State of Pennsylvania no longer considers Bob White an extant species in their state. They're looking at translocations, but right now the bird is considered extirpated. Ohio is planning a translocation. West Virginia is planning one. Delaware has recently done translocations. New Jersey has done and, and is currently going to be doing some more translocations. And most of the states east of, of the Mississippi River have a really highly localized struggling population. Um, just an aside, east of, east of Missouri is, is, really, is really critical for Bob Whites um, in that part, part of the country. And I, and I don't know if people realize how serious it is that a once ubiquitous bird, part of, part of our landscape, from the East Coast all the way to, to, to Western, or excuse me, Eastern Colorado is, is now considered um, in, in real trouble. Missouri's no different. Let's take a look at our roadside survey data from, from Missouri. So we're about 1983 to the latest data we had was 2014. And um, we've lost over 80% of our birds in Missouri in that time frame. 80% is a huge number, and we're still losing them at about 1% to 3% nationally uh, across the range. So the Bob White is in real trouble. Um, these data and a lot of anecdotal data from, from and, and real empirical data from across the range show that Bob White is in real trouble. Well, this is from a statewide perspective. Let's look at conservation areas in Missouri. So this is data that was collected on areas that in, in Missouri public land that we used to call quail emphasis areas. So these were areas that were publicly owned, managed by the Missouri Department of Conservation, where we decided in about 2005 that the department was going to put in extra labor, extra dollars, and a real emphasis on Bob White management on these areas. I mean, there was about 19 of them it ranged up to a number of about 21 as more areas came on. But as a part of this, we monitored what the population was doing to see if we were getting results for all the effort. So these are the number of coveys heard per survey point from 2005 to 2013. So quickly in October, biologists go out to pre-selected points on conservation areas and count the number of coveys they hear calling. It's not the traditional Bob White call. It's a covey call that coveys do first thing in the morning, right at the crack of daylight, as, as a kind of way to space themselves out and, and kind of distribute spatially across the landscape. So we count these, and that's a good way of monitoring how many coveys we have. So we started this, this emphasis in 2005, and by 2013, we had lost about 30% of those coveys. So not only did we not um, gain ground, gain birds with all of this strong emphasis on quail, we actually lost quail. And Kyle and I both manage quail emphasis areas and we began to get frustrated to see these numbers. All this effort we were putting in, we were not seeing the results that we wanted. So we began to ask some questions which led to this study. Um, so let me back up just a, just a quick minute to talk about how quail have been traditionally managed on these quail emphasis areas. So in Missouri, at least, and really across the Midwest, um, quail on public land have been managed really with a focus on woody cover and winter food. So we're talking about shrub thickets, uh, plums, blackberries, dogwoods, things like that, hardcore woody cover and winter food, like food plots, milo food plots, corn food plots, things like that, soybeans, as a way of thinking that this is really the toughest time in a quail's life. Let's manage for that and get these quail through the winter. And then that's how we will get um, 
that, that, that was the basis of our management, let me say. Um, however, as we saw in that previous graph, population response was really lower than expectations. However, at the same time, we began to note uh, superior quail populations on our grassland dominated conservation areas. So we're talking about uh, native prairie for the most part. Kyle and I both manage native prairie. He has more and bigger areas than I do, but we both started to notice higher quail numbers on these areas anecdotally when we were out doing routine management to the point where when we hunted together, we didn't hunt our quail emphasis areas. We went straight to the prairies. That's where we hunted because we knew we had a better chance of encountering cubbies. And so these observations really led to, to this study, began to ask a lot of questions in our, in our mind is, is what is going on such that when we're really trying to manage for quail, we're producing very, very few or, or lower than expected. We were still producing quail, but lower than expected. Whereas on these grassland areas, managed primarily with fire and grazing, where quail were not the emphasis, we were emphasizing natural community management, quail were actually at some cases two to three times higher, according to our surveys, than on our traditional area. So that sort of the background and, and how this study really got rolling. So let's look at the project description a little bit. So for five years of, of data collection, really we have, we have seven because we, we did some pilot work and but that's not gonna be really included in the analysis. Uh, we, we compared quail production. So what we hypothesized was going on we certainly knew we were producing more quail on the grasslands and we thought it was was more a function of better nesting success and brood survival than it was a winter cover issue or, or, or bringing more birds through the winter time so we wanted to look at production uh, quail production on traditionally managed conservation areas versus grasslands over this period we had three traditional sites in our study we have the Talbot Conservation Area, Shawnee Trail, which is over, Talbot is in Lawrence County, far southwest Missouri. Shawnee Trail is in very far western Missouri, southwest. It actually borders the Kansas state line. And Bodart Conservation Area just north and a little bit west of Springfield. We only had two years of data there. Uh, we had three grassland sites. We had the uh, the Shelton Memorial Prairie, which was only 320 acres. And, and as you'll see in the data, it functions um, not really like a grassland in terms of, of, of quail management, but more like a traditional site. And Kyle will explain that as he gets into more of his, his presentation. Stony Point Prairie uh, in Dade County and Wakanta Prairie up near El Dorado Springs. The southernmost site was Talbot and the northernmost site was Wakanta and they're about 50 miles apart. All right, so here is a typical management approach for a um, traditional site. So this is an aerial photograph of Talbot Conservation Area and it's based on old uh, small dairy farm or, or old farms of the 1950s and 60s when quail were doing really well. NBC took the model and said, hey, quail are doing well in this very fragmented, broken landscape. And we always thought quail were a species or, or a bird that, that were hatched on 40 acres and never left that 40 acres in its entire existence. And so that's kind of how we focused on management. Um, it's very small scale. So this is a 40 acre unit. So you can see how we're, met, we're managing on very small units. It's linear. Uh, so We've got linear, the, the arrow now is pointing to a, a linear uh, shrub row. So we have shrubs planted. Uh, we've got food plots planted. So we've got winter cover, the winter food, that key that we were talking about early that we really focused on. And then we did have some nesting cover. There was some, some thought to nesting cover, which this planted native grass patch of tall blue stem, uh, tall Indian grass represents here. So, so there was some thought to nesting cover 
but the primary uh, emphasis was on this winter, winter cover, winter food, very linear, very small scale. Now let's contrast this with a, with a grassland uh, approach. What we tried to do is take, uh, to, to show 40 acres of grassland versus 40 acres of a traditional approach. And as you can see in, in the grassland um, model, it's very open. There's none of this linearity. So there's no planted food plots. There's no planted linear shrub strips. Uh, the focus here is on nesting and brood habitat. There is almost continuous nesting and brood habitat when it has been disturbed on a proper, proper duration and a proper frequency and a proper scale. It's almost continuous nesting and brood habitat. There's still lots of shrub clumps. This arrow represents a clump of, of uh, plums, a plum thicket, we call them here. Or then, so you can see those dark um, splotches scattered out. So there's scattered shrub clumps, clumps of sumac, blackberry. Uh, some grasslands have more than others, depending on past management. But you can kind of get the picture that, that, it, that it's focused on, on this nesting and brood habitat rather than winter cover and management was primarily fire and grazing. Another good aerial view of Talbot Conservation Area. This is a great photograph to show how it's broken up into small uh, quote unquote farms that are managed in a very linear and very small way. And Stony Point, which is a grassland area, you can see how it looks quite different. Both areas are capable of producing Bob Whites, but one area anecdotally was doing much better than the other. So that's what the study was about. All right, so we captured birds with funnel traps uh, during the covey behavior period of January through mid-March using combination of, of Milo, cracked corn, things like that. We put radio collars on these birds. We aged them, of course, sexed them, put radio or put a band on each bird and we let them go. And we followed them through the nesting period, which turns out to be um, one, of the, one of the more interesting findings of this study, I think, was what's going on during this very, very long nesting period. So tracking them somewhere any time from when the collar went on until the bird died or until about October 1. So here's the photograph that shows a bird in hand. This male here has a collar attached. You can barely see the antenna below the gentleman's hand there holding the bird. Uh, the, the collar essentially disappears on the, on the bird's chest. And um, we preen it in very well, and the, the birds go ahead and preen it in too. So it, it's, a, it, it's a really cool attachment method and um, worked out very, very well. <clears throat> so here's our data set. It turns out over the five years that we collared over 1,500 birds between the sites. We monitored over 500 nests. And it turned out to be the single largest radial telemetry quail study ever, ever done in the state of Missouri. We are, are very proud of our data set. We think it's robust. We think it has, uh, it's powerful. And we really think that it has major significance to the future of quail management in our state and hopefully across the Midwest. So that's some of the background. Let's get into some, some data and I'll do a few slides and then I will turn it over to Kyle. So one of the first things we want to look at is nesting. So these are results from 2014 to 2018. The top three sites are the traditional sites. The bottom three sites are grasslands. What I want to point out is when we did this work, we ensured that we had 60 birds collared per site per year. So for instance, Stony Point didn't receive 70 callers and Talbot 30. We didn't, we didn't do anything like that. We went into it with each site receiving the same amount of callers or each or having an equal number of birds on the air radioed at the beginning of the season. 
a uh, couple of things I want to point out first is um, nest success. You can see on the right, uh, Bodark was 18%. Again, we only had two years of data, but 18% is, is really bad. Talbot, a full five years of data on Talbot, we had 31% nest success. Shawnee Trail, 33%. Those are really, really poor. And those percentages are, are nowhere near sustaining a population um, for any length of time going forward. Um, I want to also point out that the number of nests incubated uh, compared to the prairies were fairly low. So let's move down to the prairies. Uh, so just for, just for a minute, just kind of ignore Shelton and I'll, I'll circle back to get that. Stony Point Prairie, we had 148 nests incubated. So remember, they had the same number of, of birds collared on Stony Point as we did Talbot, but we had an, 44 more nests incubated on, on Stony Point, the nest success of 44%. Wakanta, we had four years of data, we had 89 nests incubated there and 43% nest success. So as you can see quickly here that nest success is clearly higher on these grassland sites. Now Shelton was only, was only 320 acres of grassland managed with fire and grazing, really good stuff, uh, but it's surrounded by a matrix of pretty hostile habitat. So some really nasty timber, lots and lots of cropland and, and pretty poor fescue habitat on, on another side. So it's, a, it's, it's an island of great habitat, a true island of great habitat in a hostile matrix. Still, it was the same nest success or relatively the same as our traditional size. But this quickly points out that nest success was higher and we were actually incubating more nests on these grasslands. So we're starting to see some, some, some answers here. Um, so if you pool all of this data, traditional management on the left, grassland management on the right, uh, the pool data for the grassland includes the Shelton data, which brings it down a little bit. We're at almost 40% on the grasslands and about 20% on traditional, or 26%, excuse me, on traditional. So we're looking at about a 13 to 14% higher nest success on grasslands, which is, which is very, very important. Um, let's look at survival rates. One of the things that we don't talk a lot about in this study, but we'll bring up here, um, these are breeding season survival rates. So March through September, uh, traditional site had, if you round it up, about 25% survival, grassland about 31% survival. So our survival rate was higher on the grasslands and our nesting success was higher. So we're starting to see maybe an inkling of why these grasslands are producing more birds than on the traditional sites. And we've got a lot more to go and I will turn this over to Kyle now. So give me a second to stop my share and um, I'll turn it over to Kyle. All right, so I'll take it from here. Thanks, Frank. Um, so, so what does all this mean? Um, a lot of what we looked at in this study was, you know, where birds were hanging out and what habitat they were using. We weren't just tracking survival and nest success. We were taking, our technicians were taking uh, habitat information. We had lots of different criteria, whether something had been burned or grazed um, in the last year or two years. Um, whether they were in a thicket, whether they were in grass, and all kinds of things that played into some of the data. Um, that, that's all important. It's important for Frank and I as managers. We needed to understand where birds are at and why they're using what 
parts of the area and what parts are they not using? Do we have wasted space out there if we're trying to manage for quail? So it turns out it's fairly simple. Um, you know, our old idea, our traditional management with food plots and all these strips and um, a lot of it wasn't usable in the past. Um, food plots are only usable for a, a few months of the, of the year. We have periods where they're just bare dirt because they've been dissed. Uh, the seeds haven't started growing yet or, or whatever. There's different stages in there that they're just not very usable. Um, if they're really clean fields, say, they may not attract bugs, so they're still not available for brood rearing. So this still wouldn't count as usable space, stuff that we considered usable years ago. Um, a lot, uh, GRA and OLF, those are our codes, uh, grassland and old field on our public lands, and it would be private lands too, but a lot of what we used to consider usable space because it was open, we thought, well, a, a quail can live there if they want to. Well, turns out they don't want to when you put a radio collar on them because it's too thick. They can't move around in it. Um, so a lot of our open fields, we just assumed open fields are always usable space. Well, it turns out that's not true. The time since disturbance was the number one factor in determining where these birds would be during the breeding season. If something hadn't been disturbed in the last 12 months, it got minimal use. Birds just didn't want to go into it. And that's because we're in a high rainfall environment and stuff just gets too thick. We need more disturbance on the landscape. Now, again, we're talking about public land. We're talking about native warm season grass plantings. Um, we're not talking about, um, you know, private fescue that would have a different structure if it was being grazed uh, versus ungrazed. Although I'll argue we did have birds move off site and ungrazed fescue also gets pretty much no use, but overgrazed fescue does not either. So we're talking about public land management of how we were doing it in the past and it just wasn't working that well. And what we thought maybe was good habitat, turns out these birds were showing us wasn't so usable. We also saw these birds choosing to nest in good brood habitat, good being stuff that had been disturbed, more open at ground level, um, lots of bare ground, interstitial space between plants where chicks could move. So we saw um, nesting happening at locations disproportionate to that um, habitat availability, that disturbed area. If, if, if a third of the area was disturbed, we would often have two thirds or more of the nests in that one third disturbed area. So it was clear that they wanted to be nesting in brood rearing habitat. So they, the old system kind of expected them, well, here you nest over here and then you're gonna have to pack your chicks 200 yards over here to some brood, an idle food plot that we left, that's your brood habitat. So we were assuming that the birds would know where that stuff was and pack their kids in some cases, several hundred yards to go find it after hatching. Um, and that's just not how it actually works out. This is an example of what we're talking about. So I'm hoping you can see my cursor. Uh, in the top left, <clears throat> look at this big void. This, these are locations of birds for the entire summer during 2014. These, so these are adult birds during the breeding season. Um, the areas that have a black polygon around them, this area here, here, were all grazed. This was idle. The yellow area down below was burned, okay? So we have this, this Northwest piece that has very few bird locations in it was idle, no burn, no graze. We have lots of birds using the burned area um, that was burned the previous fall. They seem to be happy to use it and they really like these grazed areas. Well, we're gonna move ahead one year. We graze this and see what happens. The next year, here's those adult bird locations. They happily use the grazed area all of a sudden. So that was just a big wasted space. It was just too thick and it was not useful habitat. They're still using this. They're still using the Northeast, the Southeast. 
Notice this, the next year, this, this Southwest, um, the part that was grazed the previous year, we had idled, but we burned a couple units in it and they happily used the burn units again. But if we slide down to the very Southern edge to where the year before, lots of use in the burn area, the following year with no burn, no graze, we start losing those, that use. The only use is right along the draw um, where typically the vegetation is a little thinner. Um, this stuff, even one year after burn in, in our rainfall area, 46 plus inches of rainfall a year, it just gets too thick and quail aren't using it. I have someone with a raised hand. I don't know if I know what I'm doing, but I'll attempt to. I think if someone raised their hand, if you'd uh, put your question in the Q&A um, for Kyle, that'd be great. We will get to the questions at the end, I think is, is the plan here. Sounds good. Okay. So let's think about this. Um, you know, here's what we were doing old school. Uh, the, we are looking again at a 40 acre block. It's got, maybe we would have a food plot here and this is last year's idle food plot. And here's some grass for them to nest in. And uh, lots of times on these traditional sites, by the way, um, these were pretty low diversity plantings. They were planted with cultivar warm season grasses most of our public land um, was, we would bought a lot of them in the 70s. So it might've been fescue or something and we would plant it back to warm season grasses, typically Indian grass, big blue, little blue, um, switch grass. So lots of times no forbs, very minimal quality. Uh, so they would be heavy grass dominated plantings. In a situation like this, our typical management would be you know, all right, they can nest here and they can move over here to brood rear and here's a, here's a strip. So we would say, well, man, we need to do more. We need to make more quail. Well, we got a covey in here. So what do we do? We come in and maybe we do some edge feathering. We're gonna, we're gonna help this out a little bit. So we do some edge feathering, bring our staff out, do a little bit of work. And well, maybe we, hey, let's plant Milo instead of, of wheat this year, quail like Milo better. So we were always dabbling around, doing the same kind of stuff on the same acres, just tweaking a little bit. And now let's, this year we'll, we'll put this one to millet and this one to something else. It doesn't matter. We just kept messing around with the same stuff. And at the end of the day, we still have this one covey in the same unit. We keep manipulating the same acres and not changing the structure and the function of the habitat. In this case, we didn't add any usable space. All we did was mess around with what we had and change the configuration of it. So now, honestly, this one covey, now they may be found in any of these edge feathering. So it's just gonna be harder to hunt the one covey, but we didn't add any coveys. Adding some edge feathering, adding some covey headquarters isn't producing more quail in the, in the function of breeding season that's not what the, the shortfall is. We need more usable space. So in another situation, what we need to do now and what we're moving towards on some of these traditionally managed areas based off of the findings of this study is we've got a covey. Well, we're taking out all this old tree rows, by the way, these started as shrub rows. They turned into tree rows that have trees that are 40 foot tall. Well, quail don't need trees that are 40 foot tall. Those are just raptor perches. So if we're trying to maximize quail on a place like this, we got to get rid of these tree rows. We want shrubs, but we don't need mature trees. Those are just dens for coons, possums, and perches for raptors. We're all for managing for all species. But again, if we're talking about areas to maximize quail, then that's what we need to do. And if this is one of those areas, then we need to change how we're managing. We need to get rid of the food plots. Quail lived here long before we ever had food plots in the world. Um, 
So we need to plant these to a diverse native mix, which would be, you know, lots of forbs, a um, lot less grass. And then we need to manage with cows or fire or whatever to make this thicker stuff more usable. And now all of a sudden we're adding usable space. And all of a sudden, a year or two later, we have three coveys in this unit rather than one. So in this case, we've added suitable permanent cover over time. That's what the definition of usable space is. And we can maintain the necessary disturbance to maintain the population at an elevated level. Jump to nest timing, Frank alluded to it. Um, something that we, um, we knew a little bit, but we found more fascinating with the radio callers, some of the information. We always knew that quail nests were found late in the summer, but we didn't realize to what extent. Um, first year of this full-blown study after the couple pilot years, 50% of the nests didn't even start incubation until after July 1. 53% in 2015 after July 1. That's starting incubation. They got to incubate for 23 days. So that means we're not hatching until late July, August, some even in September. 45% in 2016. Um, 50% in 2017, 59% in 2018. Let's look at the quail hatch timing. When are these hatching? The old wives tale, everybody thought I was taught the same thing. Peak quail hatch is June 15th. Well, there's June 15th. So our radio collared quail, again, 500 nests, 1500 radio collared birds, we beg to differ. Does not appear that peak hatch is June 15th. In fact, that's this the very front end of hatch. Uh, there did seem to be a large peak late June, but notice that it goes on all summer. And then it, and an equal uh, peak most years in August that was just as important. Keep in mind there in July when there's a lull, that doesn't mean, well, there's not much happening. These birds have to have time to uh, build nests, have a little bit of courtship. They're, they're laying eggs, then they have 23 days of incubation. So even though there's a lull in mid-July of hatching, that's when birds are starting incubation that are hatching in August. So the entire summer is important for nesting. Well, what does that mean to us? Okay, yeah, that's great. Um, they nest all summer. Well, management-wise, oh, well, I got ahead of myself. I'll get to that in a second. Some other little tidbits, male incubations, re-nest double clutches, things that we all heard at the coffee shop or maybe parents told us, dad told you, grandpa told you, oh, well, I ran over a nest when I was haying, but it's okay, they always re-nest. Well, we did have, this is pretty common, males incubated about 20% of the nests. Um, that happens across the range in lots of different research projects. We only had 13% of the birds attempt a second nest, and that was because their first nest failed, obviously. Um, actually attempting double broods, hatching a nest, getting them to a few weeks old, cutting them loose, and then going and nesting again was very rare. So again, a big data set, and we're only seeing 13% of the birds attempt a second nest. So that tells me if we do run over a nest doing field work or somebody's hay equipment or whatever, they're not necessarily gonna re-nest. And in fact, the majority of the time, it looks like they're not gonna make that additional effort. We only had 3% of the birds that made it all the way to try in a third nest. We cannot rely on these re-nests to make up for failed nests. This first nest is critical. So what are the implications of this? This is what I jumped ahead accidentally a minute ago. So what does this mean? Well, in the public land world, we used to tell managers, hey, Postpone if you're doing any haying on public land, you wanna do it after July 15th, that gets past the nesting season. Well, not true. If we're really managing for quail, there's probably never a good time to hay. Um, if, if quail is our number one goal, haying probably doesn't fit into the rotation. Mowing, when are we mowing? Why are we mowing? We need to think about all these things. Spraying, we often go out, we used to have our field staff go out and especially on native prairies and, and these, these grasslands that we're talking about for this study site were native prairies. And by that we're talking, you know, 200, 300 species of plants, very diverse stuff that's been here for 10,000 years, lots of forbs, same grasses, but, but not planted, you know, real deal native prairies. Um, well, we would go out, we have to, you know, protect those areas from 
Cerisa Lespediza, for example. So we would have staff gridding a whole area, gridding an entire prairie or whole fields with an ATV looking for every bit of Cerisa. And then often they're out there doing that in July and August. Well, when we have quail nesting all summer, there's no doubt there was incidental running over of nests. So we need to think about, can we, can we adjust? And what we found out was um, a lot of the early summer nests were in units with residual vegetation, which you would expect. The early season nests, the first half of summer nests were not in burn units, no shocker. Well, if we're gonna have staff go out and spray Cerisa on the front end of summer, they need to be going in burn units where we know there's no nests. On the flip side, July and August nests tend to shift towards units um, that had less vegetation. Those areas that were too thick, they bailed out of those and they wanted to nest in areas that were, had even been burned that spring, just enough regrowth to cover the hen. So they honestly didn't need the dry grass that we used to been, think to make a nest bowl. They would lay eggs as long as the vegetation was tall enough, they could pull a little over to cover them up or areas that were grazed were, were readily used for later summer nests. So um, we've even moved into spraying Cerisa with different chemicals now. We've moved way into to mid-September on some areas just to avoid incidental nest destruction. I wanna cover uh, an addition that we had to the study. Um, in the middle two years, we had a, a student from the University of Arkansas, Jake McLean, he was getting his master's degree and, and he did a, some research on raccoon population estimates and travel patterns. And what I'm gonna share with you is from Talbot and Stoney, two of the areas that were covered for five years. People often talk about predators and oh, we're not paying attention to predators. Well, we did. Um, we looked into this to see what kind of difference it would make and, and how they moved across the landscape in these traditional areas versus grasslands. We know we have scent stations all over the state, so we know that our numbers are going up. Raccoons have increased fourfold, uh, over fourfold since 1977. Shouldn't be any surprise to anybody. Fur prices have been, for the most part, depressed for years. Um, opossums and skunks, same problem. Um, when we looked at the population estimates, this is based on those ear tags that you saw. Well. No surprise, um, Talbot, 22% forest cover, had a high number of raccoons per square mile, square kilometer in the estimate. Uh, these other sites had really limited forest cover, but notice Stony has fairly high raccoons. We wanna focus on Talbot and Stony here. So raccoons per square kilometer, based off reciting with these ear tags. But we also um, GPS collared a few, Jake did, so we could track how much time they spent on the area and how their travel patterns moved across the area. Four on each site and trying to look at, at how they came across the landscape and how they might encounter quail nests. What we found out is on Talbot, they spend the majority of their time staying on Talbot, about 60%. Whereas Stony Point, they only they spend less than 30% of their time actually on Stony Point. So even though they were recited and counted in that whole um, population estimate, their time on the area is, is quite limited. So if we actually use that as density times occupancy, our realized density um, on Talbot is about six uh, coons per square kilometer. And on Stony Point, it's two. So we have one third of the raccoon situation on a grassland. Makes some sense. More open, typically going to be less um, less active with raccoons versus uh, all those tree rows and all that area on, on Talbot. Let me show you how they use the landscape. Uh, focus your, your, your eyes over here on this west side. Here's a heavy piece of timber on Stony, and then this wooded draw. But I'm going to show you how one raccoon spent its time in that area. Everything is linear. Everything for the most part stays close to the draw. They have to stay close to trees. That's their escape cover. Raccoons need mature trees, just like quail need thickets. Raccoons have to get away from dogs, from coyotes. Unless you're a big boar coon, you're not gonna go out in the middle of the grassland because it's too dangerous and something might kill you. 
So they have to be close enough to be able to run up a tree for escape cover. If we move to Talbot and look, we have way more woody cover strung all over the place. And I'm gonna show you how a raccoon used Talbot. It looks like a shotgun pattern. Um, and we feel that this is because they can go anywhere. They can, they can run any direction and get to a tree to escape uh, any kind of predation event. So uh, this makes a big difference on how they're moving across the landscape. When we took the movements of raccoons and we overlaid it with the locations of nests, a couple things stood out. For one, we found out on Stony, raccoons average distance traveling from mature cover was only about 40 meters, whereas Talbot, they would go almost twice as far out into the open. And again, with the belief that they could escape in any direction to get up a tree. When we overlaid those movements with where the quail nests were, we found out that on the Stony, only 27% of the nests, quail nests would have potentially been exposed to raccoon travel areas. Whereas on Talbot, 50% of the quail nests potentially could be predated because they were overlapped with active um, raccoon travel areas. So what does all this mean? Obviously the data and following the birds around and, and collecting all this data, we wanna, we wanna use it for something and it has to be meaningful. Um, what we're trying to get out to managers, private landowners, whoever is interested is in the case of the predation, cut down mature trees. Quail don't need them, um, especially if we're in a grassland setting. Those historically grasslands were maintained with fire and, and we have way more trees than we used to have on these sites, on a lot of sites, um, especially across the western part of our state. Um, so not if we're just, if we're managing for quail, they don't need mature trees. But if we're managing for natural community, um, on grassland type areas, we don't need mature trees in those situations either. Final thoughts, listen, the, the bottom line is adding new usable space is the key to large increases in quail populations. If we keep tweaking stuff and we keep nibbling around the edges, we're never gonna move the needle. We have to take stuff that is not usable, either it's too thick or it's too sparse in the case maybe of undergrazed fescue, wrong vegetation types, um, which would be non-native forages in a lot of cases. Um, um, CRP would be an example. We have CRP that could be good for quail, but with, with not enough manipulation, most of that is not very usable space. So we need more usable space if we wanna increase quail populations, both public land and private land. We need to consider creating usable space where none exists. Obviously you get the biggest bang for your buck with large crop fields or timber units um, where there's absolutely no quail. If you can turn a large crop field into something usable, we get an immediate explosion of quail. That's been done all across the United States. We know it works. It's hard to compete with commodity prices. That's probably not a long-term competitive edge we're ever gonna get. On public lands, we can do some of those things. Timber units, thinning them down to make them usable space is also another option. Managing habitat against predation is also vital in today's fragmented landscape. A lot of these populations are so limited and so fragmented um, that we've, we've got to stack the odds in their favor as best we can. Trapping predators year round, that's not gonna happen in the state of Missouri. It's not a viable option and it's not necessary when we don't even have the habitat in most cases up to snuff, we need to focus on the habitat. We also need to open our minds as biologists, as enthusiasts, as hunters, whatever, that a lot of previous beliefs regarding nest timing, nest effort were debunked. A lot of stuff that we found out from this research proved that it was just old wives tales and, and we need to open our minds to new research, new information, and then employ that out in the field. Appreciate having the opportunity to speak with you. I think we'll try to answer some questions here. Um, we'll see what, is, what has come in. Kyle and Frank, I'm gonna kind of put you on gallery view. I don't know if it'll make everyone's go on to gallery view, but we have three questions so far in the Q and A. 
it looks like the first one, Kyle, you kind of spoke to it a little bit, but if you want to comment further, I don't know if you guys can pull up your q and A. I I can read it to you as well. Um, what was the plant composition on these grasslands versus the other survey area? So you said a little bit about that, but if you want to say some more, please do. Yes. So again, the grassland sites were native prairies, so highly diverse. Um, would have had the same warm season grasses, but also some native cool season grasses, but literally a couple hundred forb species. So extreme diversity, which obviously lends itself well to attracting bugs, winter food through seeds. But understand those grassland sites, none of them had any food plots. These, these birds are living off of native insects and native seeds. All right, we have a question from Ryan. So with that nesting timing and the two peaks we saw there, do you think a native haying regime where we hay the field once a year on July 1st would be a decent option for landowners that need to hay and can use natives to do so in a quail friendly manner? Um, I'll take that first and I'm sure Kyle will, will add to that. So one of the things that, that Kyle and I always stress is, is look, we we understand that landowners that people that have working land have to get something out of this this is not north florida where quail come first so they have to they have to get something out of that and and one of the things that that we want to be able to do is is help landowners to be able to 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 get some production out of their land and still have quail. We know that we cannot ask folks to, well, what we're doing on our public land is we're trying to maximize quail. I don't know, we can't expect most land, landowners to do that. So we, in, in my thoughts, if we could push nesting earlier, so that, that's July 1, um, maybe something to think about, uh, it would, it would get a lot of the first, a lot of the that first peak would be out of there. Those chicks would be, would be hatched. Now they they may be susceptible to to haying equipment because they can't fly then, but but they but they would be hatched, and a lot of the quail would be in the very early stages of nest laying, and and uh, so so the birds that didn't that didn't nest early, are kind of in that early stages of nest laying, potentially. Um, if you disturb a nest with only one or two eggs in it, you're going to, that quail will, will probably re-nest more readily than one that has, you know, eight to eight to 10. So that may be an option. I need, I need to think about the logistics or, or I need to think about that a little more in, in light of our data. But, um, but we, we sure want to be able to, to, to come out of this research with some some recommendations, not only for public land, for, for us managers that can do essentially whatever we want to do in terms of when we do disturbance, but that's not where we're gonna make our hay on quail, uh, no pun intended, really. We're gonna have to do it on public, on private land, excuse me. So we're gonna have to figure out ways to, landowners to be productive, to get some production, but also have quail in the mix. Does Kyle, do you have anything to add there? Nope, sounds good. But Looks like Kyle answered a question about armadillos, um, that they've been here in our state for a while. And while they are a nest predator, that hasn't been as extreme as raccoons, for instance. Yep. Correct. So armadillos, yeah, I typed an answer to, to a person's question, but ask about armadillos moving into other states. And so it must be somewhere north of us. We've had them here for years. Armadillos have been documented for dating quail nests um, in Texas and, and other states, but they're way down the list as far as the major problem. Um, skunks, possums, raccoons, snakes, um, always come out way higher on the predation than, than armadillos. Um, still, our habitat's the issue. Uh, we've just got to create more habitat. So here's an interesting one. I'd like to hear the answer to this also. 
um, because we speak about this with other grassland birds quite a lot. Matt asks, what is your ballpark average cow-calf pairs per acre and what duration are you grazing? So on our, our grassland sites, um, we're pretty moderate. Granted, we're using this for wildlife management. So the cows are a tool for us, not a moneymaker, but we're grazing about a thousand pounds per five acres for 120 days. So May through August. Um, so during the summer growth, during the good fescue summer slump, they can come, you know, and graze on the good prairie grasses and, and get better gains. Um, so it's good for the 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 cattleman, the rancher, um, and it's good for us because we remove some of that overage, that tonnage. Now, now Frank on some of the planted grasses, he does something a little different. Yeah, so we we graze a little higher on our planted grasses, so um, they are much more uh, productive in terms of the, the amount of biomass that they produce. And so to be able to, to get them uh, down to a, a density where we have bare ground and we have some semblance of forward production, we have to graze them a little harder. So we are usually at, a, at a, uh, an animal unit, so a thousand pounds per four and a half acres. And we, we typically do steers or heifers um, something starts out in the 500 pound range when they come on in, in say April 20th to 25th. And then we graze them in some cases all the way through September because we generally, if we pull them off late August, we get a huge flush of Indian grass such that you, you can barely tell we've grazed. So um, that's kind of what we're looking at. A little bit heavier stocking rate and uh, grazing them a little bit longer because we have such high biomass producing vegetation on these sites. And that is a huge problem that I think we were doing a lot of good when we started planting native grasses all over the state in the 80s and 90s. But we have, uh, we have learned a lot more with respect to the types of native grasses we plant and certainly the, the need for far more forbs and far fewer grasses in our plantings. Questions keep coming, y'all. Uh, any difference in recruitment from early nest as opposed to the late nest? Yes, yeah, so early nests are always more successful. Um, I can't recall the percentage off the top of my head, but biologically it makes sense if you think about it so those those june nests we want birds nesting on the front end um, june nests and early july nests are always more successful for one think about snakes the hotter the temperature the more snakes are going to feed they're a cold-blooded animal so earlier in the summer the cooler the temperatures the less snakes are going to be roaming around um, baby raccoons and baby possums or yeah. baby possums are riding on mom's back until mid-July. Then all of a sudden they're all on the landscape. Um, baby coons are still in the den and, until you get into, you know, sometime in June, lots of times. So the number of predators on the landscape and their activity levels increases as the summer goes on. So we, we see, although we have August nests out there and they're great to have, the hatch rate is lower. The, the front end is more important. Okay, someone asks, are eye worms an issue? So um, I'll take that. Eye worms, we have, we um, didn't examine any of our birds for eye worms. It's very, very invasive procedure to do that. Uh, but we have participated, I say we, the state of Missouri has participated in sending harvested birds to a lab in Texas to look for eye worms. We've not found any yet. Um, the folks in Florida um, jokingly call it the dry worm because it tends to be in dry, arid environments, um, probably because of the host, the intermediate host, uh, which is a cricket that probably occurs more in that dry landscape. So no eye worms, at least in the, in the limited number of birds that we've sent to Texas for the lab, um, and it tends to be more of a dry, um, 
a drier environment, more arid environment type of problem. What is the minimum size grassland needed to support quail? Well, so that's, uh, as he showed you, the, the Shelton with 320 acres, it supports quail. So we need to define support better. Um, it currently supports quail, but with 32% nest success, long-term sustainability probably doesn't exist. So when I think support quail, I'm talking 50 year viability. You know, if you're just got a 20 acre field, that's all you got to work with and you got one covey, that may or may not be sustainable for one year, let alone 20 years or 50 years. So the bigger, the better. Um, Fred Guthrie, the ex quail guru out of Oklahoma State talked about, you know, 5,000 acres blocks for a, a hundred year sustainability. So way bigger than most of us have ever thought for long-term sustainability. Yeah, and I'll, I'll echo that. Our quail um, home ranges were on the order of 200 acres during, during the breeding season. So um, we, see, we saw, of course, a large movement from winter cover to more open brood or nesting habitat. They kind of made a, a move, but um, they certainly aren't the 40 acre back 40 bird that we grew up um, being told they were. Is that largely because of one of the things you all mentioned earlier, which is it was working on 40 acres when there were a bunch of 40 acres sort of in a patchwork and now there's small areas surrounded by a more hostile landscape? I think you nailed it, absolutely. There was usable space um, across the landscape, across the county. And even if there was some hostile stuff in between, uh, it wasn't the islands that we see now. So um, even, and I'm talking, so Talbot is 4,300 acres, but we are surrounded by very hostile landscape, as you as you guys know. Um, and I'm nervous about the, the viability there, given 30% nest success, we've got to change some things. We've got to turn some things around. So um, yeah, even, even for 4,300 acres that I manage, I'm a little nervous going forward. And, and because it's just, if, it, let's just say, for instance, we have, for some crazy reason, all the quail were extirpated there tomorrow. There are no other birds anywhere around to recolonize that. That's really the problem. So that's a little related to the next question. Have we had any success manually relocating quail to areas where they no longer exist, or must they exist already somewhere in the vicinity? Um, so that work has been done a little bit in Texas with Bob Whites and Blue Quail, but, but the gold standard is the work at Tall Timbers in, in Florida. They have done what they call some short term or some, some short distance translocations of birds, say within the, the pine plantation area or the birds that don't, that don't have there or, or the birds that don't exist on a plantation after they get it usable. What I'm calling a plantation is like piney woods, not, not kind of what we used to the traditional name of it. Um, and birds have done well, but they've also translocated birds to places like Delaware and New Jersey, and those birds have been sustainable. So yes, it has shown promise and it has shown to work at least on the East Coast, um, but the key there is the habitat must be usable first and before they even think about releasing birds because uh, these are these are a very very valuable resource so there's a lot of work that goes into it beforehand but but I guess the the short answer is yes it it does work it, 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 well it has worked it has shown promise uh, at least on the east coast we it, it hasn't really been done in the midwest uh, Kansas moved some birds to Ohio back in the late 90s I don't know the, the protocols probably weren't great but um it's, it's been monkeying around with a little bit, but at least on the East Coast, it has shown some, some promise. Important note there on the moving birds, what Frank was talking about, those are all wild birds. Wild birds move to these translocated places, not pin raised birds being released to try to reestablish populations. All 
All right. We, we still have a couple questions for y'all. Thanks for sticking 16. with us. Did you see more usage of shorter grass prairie, little blue slash side oats, et cetera, that wasn't disturbed versus the big blue stem Indian and switch? Also, was any of the undisturbed shorter stuff pretty diverse and you still didn't see the birds using it? Thanks. So actually we don't have, most of our prairie sites aren't the big six foot tall Indian grass. Uh, it just doesn't grow near as robust on them. So they are dominated more by little blue um, and, and those and side oats and, and still has the high diversity and still see very little use if it wasn't disturbed. It's still too thick when it rains 50 inches a year around here and birds just don't want to be in it. And it looks like our last question in the Q&A guys is genetically speaking, doesn't it make sense to get fresh genetics in order to get better, better viability within the genetics? Yeah, so that's a great question. And, and we tried to investigate that um, because some of the things that we were finding um, were, were maybe leading us down a road of, like for instance, on a Talbot, as I mentioned, that sort of that island, we were seeing fewer eggs per clutch. We were seeing um, nesting that was delayed about three weeks. So we were seeing some things that that could be resource related. So birds had fewer resources or potentially there may be some genetic issues. And we, we tried to investigate that. We took blood from birds from Talbot and Stony Point uh, but it, it, it didn't work out to, to, to give us a whole lot. So, um, but here's my thought is absolutely, we need to be thinking about that. Um, I would, I mean, I don't know, but I would hypothesize that our birds on Talbot ha are or will be less genetically diverse than the birds on the grasslands because they just, you know, th there's no birds there's no immigration out there's, well, there's a little bit, but those birds die off quick, but there's no birds coming back in from the neighbors. Um, you know, and we're seeing dispersal of two to three miles on some of these sites. So it's not like birds are refusing to travel that far. It's just that there's just no birds within two or three miles to, 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 re, to, to come in and, and trade back and forth. So I think it probably will be an issue going forward and I would love to investigate that somehow. So guys, we have a, oh, we have a couple more questions, but we, if you open your chat, you can see some nice comments that people have made. Um, great session. Thank you for the lowdown on quail habitat. Ryan answered um, regarding haying. And then Valerie says, the session makes me appreciate the technology of today is being put to such good use to understand what's really happening in our environment versus old school assumptions. And I think that's the most exciting thing about your study is that, that challenging of old school assumptions. So Jerry kind of commented on your, on your answer about genetics there in the Q and A. Um, and then Matt, yes, you can watch the taped webinar after the fact. Absolutely. I'd like, he says, I'd like to have all of our staff watch it and hopefully the supervisors as well. Very good stuff. Thanks, guys. Great. Absolutely. Great. Um, it is being recorded and we're going to have it posted on the MRBO website and we can send an email to, to folks that have attended um, to tell you exactly where to find that. So. Great. All right. That's everything. That's about it. Thank yeah. you guys for sticking with us here. Yeah. Thanks for thanks staying for late everybody. at the office yep. once again. Exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. Exactly. Yep. Yep. Enjoyed so. it. Good. There's some more thank yous coming in the chat. Yeah, we can see it. It's great. Thanks guys cool. for for attending. Um, again, Kyle and I are always so excited to talk about quail. All right, Kyle, Frank. Have a good night, guys. Yeah. Thank you. Thank very you much. guys. Very Thank much. you so much, guys, for putting this together.
Thanks. Yep, Absolutely. Thanks. We'll see ya. See ya right, sometime.